three quotes related to India and good design. India is an abstraction. India is a geographical term. It is no more a united nation than the equator. This is from a speech made in 1931 by Winston Churchill, the then Prime Minister of Britain. The design profession has formally existed in India since 1916. This is the opening sentence from the Wikipedia page of the Association of Indian Design Industry. And the third quote is design to indicate, to draw, to contrive, to form a plan of, to set apart a plan or scheme formed in the mind. This is a definition of design from the Chambers English Dictionary. I'm not certain how many of us will agree with the opinions expressed in these quotes and to what degree. But it is a fact that conventional opinions about what is Indian, what is design, and therefore what is Indian design are largely derived from a Western cultural standpoint, especially a standpoint of an industrialized society. That explains why the Association of Indian Design Industry believes that the design profession in India has formally existed for only about 50 years, even though it should be obvious that the extraordinary variety and level of designs that have been generated in India through centuries could only have been the outcome of a formal and highly evolved system of design. The fact that it is not obvious to many of us, even in the profession of design, indicates that we are looking at very limited and limited notions of what constitutes Indian design. Evidently, we need to be wary of unquestioningly accepting such Western, or let us say, non-Indian opinions. These opinions are formed on the basis of some underlying sweeping notions which we should recognize. What are these notions? First is the current conventional concept of what makes a nation. This is essentially a notion of political identity that we have adopted from the Western world, which has been formed by their history. Indeed, the very word nation is derived from Latin, and the name India itself was given not by the people of this land. Second is the concept that India somehow got a distinct identity only after the advent of the British, an opinion circulated by the British which limits the definition of India to a certain size and region, and the definition of Indian to race. However, size and region are not fixed. Geographical boundaries and racial composition change over time. As many writers remind us, the British themselves followed a process of making India, which involved breaking India and reforming its boundaries and peoples. Interestingly, Britain itself today is a fraction of the size that it ballooned to about 200 years ago. And as this Wikipedia page informs us, it was only in 1707 that its present configuration resulted from the union of Scotland and England. If we were to apply the same logic and tell the British that they would only qualify to be called a nation when they were a certain size, I'm doubtful that they would accept it. Third is the concept of design noted in dictionaries and many books on design derived from Western sources, which almost exclusively limits designing to the act of drawing or planning, and makes a separation between planning something and actually creating it. This separation is an outcome of a fairly recent occurrence in terms of world history, commonly termed the Industrial Revolution. This happened about 250 years ago, not in India, but in the Western world. It is not a universal method of design, either in terms of time or space. 
It is not the way in which design was practiced historically anywhere in the world, and certainly not in India. It did not exist in the Indian perspective. So, what is the Indian perspective? To understand this, the first thing to do is to move away from definitions. A definition, by its very meaning, defines or limits, and especially so in the context of India. The distinguished Indian scholar Chaturvedi Badrina notes in his detailed discussion of the Mahabharata, and I quote, one characteristic of Indian thought has been that in the place of definitions of things, it asks for their attributes or lakshans. That is because all definitions are arbitrary, whereas the lakshanas are what show the thing through which a thing becomes manifest. Thus, not the definition of truth or love, but the attributes of truth and love by which they are known is what is central. End of quote. To understand the Indian way, therefore, we need to look at not the definition of Indian or of design, but the attributes of being Indian and of Indian design. To look for these attributes of Lakshana, we have to expand our view, to examine India and Indianness as conceived by Indians. To do so, we must go back to the earliest Indian traditions of philosophy or Darshan, which literally means to see. How we see ourselves forms our first and primary identity. Our most ancient philosophical works, such as the Isha Upanishad, talk about the infinite vastness of space and time in which individual lifetimes of human beings count little and are yet an important part. In the Indian system thus, the ideal individual sees herself or himself as an extension of the clan, the community, the country, and even the process, all of which are connected and are part of the same atma or spirit. This was not just an abstract principle that scholars studied. It was explained and handed down in stories and tales and enacted in folk drama and dance. For example, in the epic Mahabharata, one of the reasons for the great war is believed to be the King Kutarashtra's inability to see and accept this interconnectedness, despite the advice of his minister, Vidura. This basis of Indian culture of being sensitive to a wide context led to its overriding lakshanas or characteristics. The first of these lakshanas is responsibility and self-reliance. As the poet and philosopher Rabindranath Tagore explains, I quote, Unlike in Europe, the state has never been in India a central thing in the life of the nation. While European civilization assigned a central position to the state, Indian civilization from ancient times put in that place society guided by dharma as it was conceived by the people. End quote. This production of ancient Indian society survived even to the 18th century until the British changed this system. The Ghanaian historian Dharampa examined the internal records that the British made for circulation amongst themselves when they moved into India. These records show that despite deliberate efforts by the British to break up the structure of Indian society, people all over the subcontinent themselves took on the responsibility to protect and repair cultivable land, forests, rivers, wells, water tanks, schools, temples, mosques, marketplaces, etc. Both within a village and between different villages. For instance, in a survey of over 2,000 villages in South India in the Chengalpattu district during the mid-18th century, it is noted that a certain amount of the total agricultural land and produce of the village, according to ancient custom, was kept aside for maintenance of various institutions and infrastructure. This was termed Swatantrams, which literally means independent. This was a custom in the subcontinent before colonialism, 
that the community itself always retained independent control over a certain ratio of the land of the village and its yield, which was not taxed, whatever be the political kingdoms that came over it, but was used responsibly by the people themselves. The second luxury is respect for people with divergent views and sub-identities and simultaneous existence of such identities. Since it was believed that every individual has the latent capability and the responsibility to channelize the universal spirit, historically, within the Indian culture, we see that though they may have been a dominant school of philosophy or religious belief, generally, there was space for various beliefs to exist simultaneously, even if they were not practiced by the majority. The Himalayas, for instance, have been venerated from ancient times as Pul Parvats, a lofty family of mountains, with the idea of one family of people encompassed by them, who had overlapping regional, professional, or community-based identities, which had room to be changed or reorganized. Thus, most schools of Indian philosophy in successive centuries have stressed an interdependence between people, objects, and their contexts. For instance, Hinduism in its later years draws from Buddhism, Jainism, and even Islam and Christianity. Similarly, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, etc. arise out of an attempt to distill, adapt, or evolve a reformed idea of Hinduism and other beliefs. That brings us to the third Lakshana, which is the Lakshana of cyclical ideas of space and time. In Indian tradition, space and time are believed to exist in cosmic cycles, which have no beginning or end. Each cycle is actually a process of regression or falling. So we live in Kali the last and the worst in the cycle of four yogas, which repeat endlessly. Such ideas are a vivid part of the Indian imagination in which they witnessed as much in our daily conversation as in films, songs, and proverbs. We have to fall back with the phrase Gita Yogi to explain away present day problems. This is completely different from dominant Western thought. It sees time as Kenya, along which, according to the Darwinian concept of the survival and progress of the fittest, humans march on to claim and exploit the resources of the Earth and now even of Mars and the Moon. This is from a site called Lunar Land, which actually sells that. In the Indian traditions, in contrast, since space and time are believed to be constantly expanding and shrinking with no strict boundaries, human existence is also seen as a cyclical journey with no strict boundaries. Since very ancient times, the Indians have journeyed constantly within the subcontinent, across the length and breadth of its extremities, on well travelers routes, regardless of different political kingdoms that may have controlled different parts of these routes. Two very famous such routes, termed the Uttar Path and the Dakshin Path, are known in Indian history from about 3,000 years ago. These routes roughly coincide with the present day national highways 207 and were taken not only by kings on their way to conquer other kingdoms, but also by ordinary people, pilgrims, preachers, traders, etc who did not just associate themselves with their immediate family and place of origin, but simultaneously identified with lands, rocks, rivers, and forests across the subcontinent. The memory of being Indian is thus not just linked to being free of British rule, but goes far back in time, linked by ideas of responsibility for its sacred geography and connections with local and larger histories. So, how do these Lakshmi and Indianness manifest or reflect in design? The unique characteristics of Indian design arise from a design philosophy of there being no barriers in the cosmos. This gives humility to the designer instead of an arrogant attitude of specialization. In fact, in the Indian tradition, there is no strict division between the arts and sciences or between art and craft. craft is science, Vigyan, and the lore of crafts called Vigyanik or scientist is given an important status. 
There is also no difference between art and craft. As S. Balaram reminds us in his book, Thinking Design. In India, the word used to denote both is Kala. Neither is there any separation between architecture and art. For example, the Shilpa Ratna Kosha, a 17th century text on Buddhism temple architecture, starts with a prayer to Vishwakarma, the divine architect in Indian tradition, who is also the god of the arts and crafts, and whose five sons are the ancestors of the important groups of craftsmen. And in a complete contrast to the way in which design is generally practiced today, there is no separation between theoreticians and practitioners, between planning a design and making it. Texts in architecture specify that the architects must not only know mathematics, sciences, and how to draw, but also how to build on the ground. The Maya Mata is a Vastu Shastra written in the 10th century. As its name indicates, it is held to be authored by Maya, one of Vishwakarma's sons and the ancestors of practitioners in woodcraft. He is called the wise and learned architect, showing that a thousand years ago, the craftsman was considered to be both a designer and builder, as well as an intellectual who could explain the rules governing design and building. Historical examples of Indian designs across various fields share some lakshanas generated from this design philosophy which I'll talk about by focusing on some outstanding examples of the fields of architecture and attire. The first of these lakshanas of design is the lakshana of flexibility and versatility. In Indian architecture, this is most evident in the way in which built and open space combine together in flexible ways for multiple purposes, multiple users, and multiple occasions. This is visible from the time of the oldest urban architecture in India, such as in the remains of the city, along the banks of the Saraswati and the Indus. Probably the most evolved instance of such multifunctional architecture is the magnificent 17th century palace fortress built in Delhi for the fifth Mughal emperor, Shah Jahan. Most of the buildings in the fort were designed as single-story pavilions linked by colonnades and courtyards as can be seen in this map, where the open spaces have been colored in black. Instead of one fixed purpose, they were formed and located such that they could be used for different functions at different times. For example, the emperor's own pavilions were not just used for sleeping and living, but also for administrative meetings and for receiving visiting ambassadors, or for celebration of festivals such as Holi. In Indian attire, this lakshana can be best seen in the tendency to use unstitched woven garments, despite the technology and the knowledge of stitching in very ancient times. The most famous of such unstitched garments is the sari. Since it is not tailored and sewn to fit one individual, it can be handed down to several generations to suit multiple users for multiple years. These are some saris that have come to me from my mother and my grandmother-in-law, which, like the saris of most women from their generations and before, are stunning and individual pieces of design. The counterpart to this immense wear is a multi-purpose dhoti, nungu or nungi, which, depending on the fabric, the weave and the trade, may be used for celebratory occasions such as pujas and weddings, or for informal occasions such as simply lounging around at home. Even traditional stitched garments in India, such as the Khagra and the Lehenga, though with a naturally diminished scope in comparison to unstitched clothes, also have the flexibility of multiple use and are handed down as family heirlooms, such as this hundred year old Lehenga. The second Lakshana is that of individuality and improvisation. Improvisation is an intrinsic Indian design strength. Consider, for instance, the stonework of the famed Taj Mahal, or the sculptured bases of many ancient temples all over India. Despite an impression of symmetry and order, motives are never repeated in exactly the same way. Or think of the pavilions and courtyards of traditional palaces. Perhaps the most widespread living example of this section is the Sahib. Though the overall dimensions are more or less fixed 
there are many variations in the sari. Even saris from the same region are never identical, though they may have characteristic motifs special to that region. Not just that, even when based on a similar overall design or created by the same weaver, no two handwoven saris are ever exactly the same. Nor does the individual uniqueness of a sari end in its making. Though urban Indians generally know only one way to drape it, a sari can be reputedly draped in 108 recorded ways and can be pleated and tied to individual preference and skill. And also used as a comfortable and resplendent dancing costume. This improvisation is visible in other forms of design practice, particularly in classical theater, music, and dance. Habib Tanbi, the famous theater actor and director, who acknowledged the influence of the design traditions of both classical and folk theater in his creation of a distinctive style of modern Indian drama, has voiced a strong belief that in Indian art, it's important to improvise. This brings us to the third Lakshana, where the latitude to improvise within a context not only gives a huge creative opportunity, but also elevates the everyday activity or artifact to something special. This contributes to a Lakshana Indian design where objects of use, from saris to cities to kitchenware, are simultaneously useful and beautiful. This was true for the majority of designs in the Indian tradition and points to a Lakshana of rigorous design thinking based on frugality despite an outward semblance of opulence. Looking at traditional designs, one finds that each object of use was also a work of art, and each beautiful object also had a use. The presence of this Lakshana, even till about 100 years ago, is recorded in an observation by George Birdwood, the director of the South Kensington Museum of Art in London, where he says that in India, everything is hand-dropped, and everything, down to the cheapest toy or urban vessel is therefore more or less a work of art. These are some images of toys, kitchenware, and other household objects from across the country, which can be called in George Merton's words, more or less works of art. This brings us to the fourth question of the Russian of sustainability. Since nothing was designed as simply utilitarian or purely decorative, most objects had a continuing use and were thought of in their entirety to form a way of life that was a celebration of all the senses. The ultimate idea of luxury, even today, is that of bespoke design, which is sold with a tagline of not just ownership or consumption of an expensive object, but an enriching, individualizing, personal experience it stays with the user for posterity. As for instance, in these beautiful saris. This is unlike the Western modernist way of design, based on making huge numbers of standardized, machine-made and repetitive products. To make this method of production work, products are designed with a shortened life cycle. In a design method especially promoted by Western designers after the world wars, the name they coined for it was planned and perceived obsolescence. Superficial changes are applied cosmetically to make these products look different and aggressively marketed as new and novel to instill in the buyer, as the famous American designer Clifford Woodstickley says, the desire to own something a little newer, a little better, a little sooner than is necessary. In contrast, Indian design education and practice stressed an optimal use of resources. Preliminary drawings and models were used very rarely and only in important or unusual building projects. Thus, the huge urban design project of the Red Fort of Delhi and its city of Shah Jahanabad took less than 10 years to build and did not require voluminous drawings or models. The court histories of Shah Jahan record only one instance of a, uh, an architectural model being made for the Red Court, and that is of the Chapta Chok, which is a type of covered market name, which was made for the first time in the Mughal Empire at that time. In a report on types of modern Indian 
buildings prepared in 1915 to survey and record how Indian design was built in the indigenous way. Gordon Sanderson, an architect employed by the Archaeological Survey of India, noted that excellent specimens of modern architecture constructed in the traditional method of Indian design in projects of different sizes, ranging from the huge Taju Masjid in Bhopal, established by the Bhagavad of Bhopal, to individual houses, dharamshalas, temples, etc. Even in complex works such as carved jalis of Adra, Pietra, Dura, the masons or inlayers drew the patterns themselves on the stone without any help from a draftsman. The designs were also highly efficient in that they integrated structure, decoration, and form. It is difficult to separate a building element into just structure or just decoration. This spirit of optimal efficiency, where no element is superfluous, is a well-recognized quality of good design. Similarly, if we look at most traditional sarees, we find that the decoration is part of the structure of the cloth. That is why it is resilient enough to withstand continued use. The design effort integrates decoration, form, and structure. It is part of spinning the material, composing the patterns, and directly weaving them on the fabric and rarely is it made through elaborate drawings. This is true of not just sarees, but also of many crafts in India, even today. As for example, in the highly complex patterns made in Sanji work, where the craftsperson skillfully cuts out patterns in paper without making any drawing beforehand. And that gets us to the last luxury, the luxury of egalitarianism. So all this was possible because instead of the idea of centralized control, the Indian approach to design was decentralized. The Maya Mata states that all the four categories of building technicians must always be honored. The hierarchy and division of responsibilities amongst these four categories. The Sabati is the architect, the Sutra Brahmi, who measures them, height and proportions, the Takshaka, who cuts or carves stone, wood and bricks, and the Vardaka, who assembles and erects the building, is clearly stated. As is the fact that depending on occasion and ability, the Sutra Brahim, the Takshaka, etc. can take on the duties and even the title of the Sabati or architect. Thus, there is no rigid compartmentalization. A sculptor could also be an architect, a painter could also be a mason, and so on. This is the main gateway to the 17th century guru Ram Rai Darbar in Erabu, also called the Chanda Darbar. Tulsi Ram, one of the artists who made many of the beautiful murals here, has painted himself in on a side panel. He names himself as Mistri Tasveer Bananiwala, mason or painter. This was possible because of a linked system of aesthetics which evolved continuously through diverse craft practitioners who came together to create distinctive design. Thus, in the red code in Taj Mahal, we find mention of not just the main master builders, Ustad Ahmad and Ustad Hamid, but also of 40 different guild heads and their teams of calendars, garden designers, carpenters, dome builders, finial makers, masons, sculptors, etc. The royal city of Jaipur made in the 18th century also successful to use in such a system. Even till the 20th century, as we saw in the ASI report of 1915, much of the decision making and design was left to the workmen. Since knowledge about aesthetics was also shared by the users and patrons, design choices across different economic classes were similar. In the sites of the Harappan cities, as Neil McGregor, director of the British Museum, notes, there seems to be little difference between the homes of the rich and the poor. And a Persian text from the 1820s, which documents 11 trade crafts and their practitioners in Bareilly, describes their clothes as being just like other inhabitants of the country or that upper class people. While a British officer in the Nizam Sport at Hyderabad writes that he could not distinguish much difference between the poor and the rich, except that the clothes of the rich perhaps slightly cleaner. ourselves individually and collectively affects what we create and how we create. We've seen that if there is anything recognizably <coughs> Indian in designs created and used by Indians, it is owing to an understanding of and an identification with indigenous aesthetics and techniques, which we must
must remember how we turn things into. Most of us have lost that understanding. Many Indians today grew up without the sustained company of an extended family or strong local networks. And in an atmosphere where empathy and attachment to our land and our culture are eroded. Additionally, our educational curriculum generally translates a system of learning derived from the modernist tradition of Europe and America. So we only find isolated rationales of Indianness in the practice of design. For example, in the widespread ability of Indians to still improvise, to be self-reliant rather than follow centralized decision-making. But this rationale is no longer guided by a unifying aesthetic and moral vision, leading to a breakdown in society and in design. If ideas of nationhood like design are modeled on imitations from the Western world, we as individuals and as designers will model our identities on stereotypes of European or North American cultures. To reclaim our identity, we need to shrug off the brainwashing that makes us constantly look into the Western world and which classifies our system as less developed, less attractive, and backward. This does not mean that we unquestioningly accept these systems, but that we analyze them and find for ourselves what is most relevant in them. Such a process of self-realization would lead to self-reliance in sync with our times. The famous Australian landscape designer, Michael White, who renamed himself Made Vijaya, is widely attributed to the creator of Design Bali Model. He has written about popular belief amongst the Balinese called the Desh Kaal Patra, juggling space, time, situation, an ancient Hindu period where balanced harmony and flexibility are as important as a strict adherence to the religious code and how it has allowed the Balinese culture to move unscathed into the 21st century. Nationality then is only incidental. Designers who cultivate the luxuries of harmonious flexibility and frugality, historically seen in Indian design, may be said to represent its kindness and unique qualities, whether or not they were born in India such as the architects Lori Dick and Kerala and Joseph Allen Stein and Delhi. Or whether or not they are trained in the modernist way, such as the craftspeople who have designed the interiors of the tribal museum at Goba and transformed its industrial framework through local handcrafted materials into mesmerizing spaces, textures, colors, and details, which are completely different from any museum anywhere in the world. Such luxury in terms of sustainability are the need we are today in the entire world and should be recognized and fostered not just as desirable qualities of Indian design but of good design in universal.